everyone welcome to another sigilant webinar my name is joe murphy today we have a great webinar in store for you all everyone loves some 2020 must have some 2020 predictions you know doing it in january sets us up for success throughout the rest of the year so we look forward to a safe and secure 2021 here at sigilant and again thank you all for joining joining me today is dr johnny milliken and dr ben harrison members of the sigilant team and guys we're gonna kick things off here with a 2020 year in review so what a year it was it's in the books and we are focused on 2021 so you guys want to kick things off here with the 2020 review johnny ben not sure who wants to take this one first sorry i was on mute there well uh, so a review of 2020 i think um one of the most important things to remember is that most people would prefer to forget 2020 occurred um but despite that being the case and it having been a challenging year um it has been an interesting year um, the biggest and most notable thing that has happened is that uh, we're looking at a real change like a massive change in paradigm for cybersecurity. the uh, the traditional bunker um the the work the work from that tier is um, gone. There is no longer a safe space behind this network um, in a controlled environment in the workplace. Now, uh, all bets are off, and that happened exceptionally rapidly, like exceptionally rapidly. There was no time to prepare. It just it just came out of the, it came out of nothing. So from that perspective, um, it's really, really important that we, um, well, look at the, those lessons and look back over them, both what we learned, but also look at what we did and didn't do to adapt to that. And that's really critical as well. So Looking forward into 2021, uh, we need to remember what the lessons were and um, we'll, we'll make sure that we uh, hopefully will have a far better 2021. Yeah, certainly from my perspective in terms of 2020, I mean, it was very disruptive for everyone, but where there is disruption, there is also opportunity. And certainly in the cyberspace, that's what actor, uh, threat actors have, um, have taken advantage of, right? The disruption about people moving and the uncertainty about how yeah, about how operations were going to continue. You know, there was all these announcements in terms of there being, you know, payments that are coming from places like the government or whatever else. So the people are are more unsure about what they were supposed to be getting or about what they're supposed to be receiving, right? So uh, two years ago, if someone was to get a, an email that says the government is about to give you some free money, people would say, that's not how this works, delete. Whereas now from a phishing perspective, I mean, lots of people have now got notifications that said the government would legitimately like to give you some free money, please. So whenever you're having people uh, have to switch their minds to things that they thought were non possible or now possible, well, then maybe they're inclined to say, well, maybe I should click this or maybe I should go and do those bits and pieces. So that overall disruption is something that threat actors have um, been taking advantage of um, in terms of people working from home as well, right? And the greater capacity for, well, if someone manages to sort of compromise I don't know, uh, an IoT device or a laptop that you own, right? Well, now it's now sitting on the same network as now that you're working from home. So those kind of things and those kind of activities and things that attackers have reacted to from so certainly from a cyber perspective in 2020, um, that disruption has really been sort of grabbed onto from an attacker perspective in terms of trying to find new ways um, or ramping up their efforts and trying to uh, gain access into systems and data. You guys want to dive into some forward thinking here, guys? Absolutely. So 2021, um, big year, lots uh, lots to do. Um, but we're going to start off just talking a little bit about cloud management, if that's okay. Uh, if you want to jump on the slide there, Joe. So first up, just to identify, what do we mean whenever we say cloud? So, I mean, cloud was originally, it was an idea to encompass just this big pile of stuff on network diagrams, which you don't need to worry about. Um, like the internet was just drawn as a cloud. And um, so effectively, while it's an abstraction, you have to remember that it's not really just someone else's computer anymore. That the term cloud is constantly evolving um, as both the market, as our attackers, as our needs expand and as they evolve. So, I mean, for example, with AWS, now I don't maybe log into AWS um, control panel every day anymore, but every time I do, there's at least three new links in there, three new services, three new things, and it's, it's pretty hard to keep up. So while for the most part, some of the new services are just repackaging of old services, iterations, iterative improvements, um, it, it, it is really, really fast evolving. 
So when we talk about cloud, we need to be specific. We need to differentiate. Um, and the one thing that really advise people to stay away from is don't look at cloud as a magic bullet because it is not. It is not a solution to fix everything. You've got to think, well, what, what are you talking about? Is it cloud services? Is it cloud hosting of your own services? Is it a public cloud, public private hybrid? Um, and I also think, I mean, what isn't cloud? If you look at your traditional data model and say, okay, well, most of our things appear to be cloud now. Is there anything left that isn't in any way cloud? Um, and really, whenever you come down to it from that perspective, it's easier to think of cloud as a, as a collection of technologies which help reduce your risk, your costs, and the complexity of IT as a whole. Um, and whenever you look at that, you really want to look at what aspects or attributes of the business IT ecosystem around you, um, which of them have cloud features or behave like cloud or are part in the cloud. Um, and you could be talking about your data centers, which have moved from physical on-prem completely into AWS hosting. You could be talking about services, things like things like Zoom. Zoom is a cloud application. Um, you could be talking about just specific tools your employees are using. But I mean, particularly in the 2020, 2021 world, you need to also consider, well, cloud also includes your access and includes your employees who are all working from home because the cloud is for them, the internet, it's your connectivity back to your services. Um, and even then down to your suppliers, you need to consider that now your suppliers, if they're using cloud services, well, how, how, how much are they taking advantage of what cloud is? Um, and really similar to what uh, Johnny had said there, the impact of COVID is really, it's exploded most office networks, it's gone. Uh, your, your fortress is now, <laughs> it's no longer safe. It's now on fire and, and burning. So from that perspective, it's really important to consider um, that your new cloud is far bigger. It, it's far bigger, it encompasses your employees' homes, it encompasses uh, your work, safe working spaces, it includes cafes, it includes so much more. Um, and no clouds are the same. I mean, before COVID, no clouds were the same, really. Now, clouds are so drastically different. Um, and really, it's important to consider, even though this is an interesting paradigm shift, it hasn't gone away from the things you needed to think about. Um, if you used to think, for example, um, that you needed high availability, you needed redundancy, you needed backups, you needed failover, yeah, you still need those, but it's just easier to provide them in the cloud. And from that perspective, it's really important to look at your cloud as a, as a holistic model of all of your ecosystem. Look at it across the board and work out. I mean, don't be afraid to ask your, your providers, um, well, okay, Zoom, do you have high availability? I mean, what is your service SLA? Is it always going to be available? Because if we're going to be depending on it, particularly cloud services as a um, dependent platform for new business in 2021, based off the back of COVID and how that's changed, you need to know that it's going to be there for you in the same way as your traditional IP phone system or, or any other services were. So absolutely critical that you consider those things. Um, really, it just comes down to making sure that you're doing your due diligence as you should be anyway with your IT infrastructure, considering cloud as a part of it, a hybrid part of it, and looking at everything across the board with the same set of eyes, the same questions, and asking yourself, um, what are you getting from it? Why, why, why are you there? And are you getting the advantages from it really? So just some key sort of key thoughts are to summarize on cloud management. Number one to try and to try and help is awareness. So you need to keep your knowledge really on the bleeding edge. You need to be keeping up with current affairs. And that means <laughs> joining our webinars. That means uh, reading our blog posts. That means um, going to the AWS uh, users forums. That, that really means just keeping up to date on what's happening. It doesn't mean implementing it all yet. It just means knowing what's out there, knowing who the providers are and what, what those paradigms are. Um, the next one then is preparedness. So you need to be prepared to pivot rapidly. Uh, doing it in a panic like we all did last March. I'm very proud of the industry as a whole is how we managed. I mean, there were some casualties, but most of us came through with a few few scrapes and bumps and bruises. Um, the rest, maybe not so much. Um, but whenever you look at it from that perspective, being prepared is what lets you move and do those things. And, and the organizations which had a solid security plan, which had an emergency plan, which had an offsite plan, they're the ones that got through it. Um, the rest, they're still catching up. Um, so be prepared to pivot rapidly. Know which of those new cloud technologies are available. So, um, for example, whenever you, you move to a remote office, you need to know, okay, well, we don't use Zoom now, but you need to know it exists. You, need, you can't start at that point. You have to have looked forward. And so then the final thing then is execution. So keep what you have up to date. And that doesn't mean just install the latest version uh, for the patching. That's critical. But what I mean by that is architecturally keep what's up to date. I mean, the... The, the server architectures which worked 20 years ago 
yeah, some of them are still actually running and they do still work. Ostensibly, email still works the same way. So it's important to look at that though and go, hold on, five years ago, we had this hybrid model based on these technologies. Are they still current? They don't have to be bleeding edge, but are they current? Are they going end of life? Um, for example, in Amazon Web Services, why are you spinning up EC2 instances just to install database servers on them? I mean, RDS exists and there's better ways of doing it. So trying to keep yourself current, it really helps you whenever the unexpected happens. So really, just as some final thoughts, so cloud security and cloud management, they're not inherent. You don't, you don't get them for free. They can be better or they can be worse, but they are non-negotiably different. And it's important to understand those differences. So I think, Johnny, if you have anything to add before jumping on to the next one. Yeah, um, so certainly in terms of cloud management, uh, there has been historically a bit of a debate as to whether or not sort of it is more secure in order to be in the cloud, right? But the, the certain the thing that you have to certainly be aware of is that uh, they operate, all of the different clouds operate a shared responsibility model. So the thing that is more secure is things like the hardware, things running on top of the hardware, hypervisors, that type of activity, that type of the security of those types of devices, right? That is taken away, that is handled by them. But from the shared responsibility model, any applications that are written on top of it, any services you put on top of that, those are not inherently more secure by virtue of the fact that they're in the cloud. By virtue of the fact that they're in the cloud, you can make them more secure. If you go and you configure them correctly, you set the model up and then you have the monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But you still have to go and do all of those things. So by virtue of just picking up something and putting it into the cloud, doesn't by de facto say, okay, well, that's now more secure, is it? You're like, mm, maybe not, right? So that's the thing that you always have to consider whenever you're either making those migrations or if you have already made that migration and then are thinking, well, actually, now that we made that migration, because that was really important, we had to do that really quickly, right? But is there a better way to do it? Maybe we should have a check to see whether or not this is the right way that this should have been done, right? So that's an important consideration for cloud management, right? Um, even if you did it in a rush beforehand, you know, the best time to do it was then, the next best time to do it is right now, because, you know, in a week, in two weeks, in a month, in a year, you know, today is the next best time, right? In terms of planting a tree, I always say that. I say this internally all the time, you know, when was the best time to plant a tree? It's 20 years ago. When was the next best time to plant a tree? Right now. So um, that's certainly the case in terms of your uh, cloud security as well. Um, and the thing to remember and to pivot off what Ben was talking about regarding the different services that you're using, right? Some, to some extent, you might not necessarily realize that you're using the cloud in some instances, right? So things like Office 365, right? So uh, it's fairly standard in terms of business usage now. Um, but if you are using Office 365 in terms of your mailboxes and all the other services you're providing, you are using the cloud. It might not be something you have built that's you know, sort of in AWS and you're running it, et cetera, but you are using the functions of the cloud. And one of the things, one of the benefits that you can bring out of the cloud is in terms of increased logging and visibility. So we would talk even to our internal customers or in particular our new customers who come along and we say, okay, well, what different data do you have? And so we've got this server and we've got all these other bits and pieces. Okay, well, what about your logs from Azure or from Office 365? And those places they go, oh, are there logs? Like, they're like, yeah, they're absolutely logs that are coming out of those places are very useful. Um, so that's a very good example, very common example we come across in terms of Azure. If you are in those cloud services, there are probably logs that you could be inspecting, that you could be sort of looking at in terms of, well, hang on a minute, do I need somebody to monitor them or I need to monitor them or do I need to retain them in case there's something that goes wrong, I need to be able to search through that and work out what went wrong. Um, in terms of AWS, into your cloud trail and setting up all your cloud watch logging, right? And getting that into somewhere where you can eventually go and search it is going to be very important either to discovering something that's going wrong that you, know, you didn't necessarily know about or after you've been sort of, you find something that's wrong and you want to try and work out how that happened, you know, those logs and those pieces of activity and that data you can get out of the cloud providers is very important. So over the course of this year for anybody in here, right? If they, if you haven't thought about how, okay, what services are we using in the cloud and what kind of visibility and knowledge can I get out of that, right? That would be a, a very good thing to take into account for, for 2021. And then finally, in terms of how you're accessing those systems, right? So previously, right, what probably happened is that it was mostly maybe dev uh, or engineering or those types of people were the only people accessing that, right? So they probably were using maybe hopefully VPNs, right? But in terms of everybody now accessing some of those cloud systems, right, it's important to try to get away from this idea of people sort of being able to log into them using their home IP addresses and things like that, because those rotate, right? Um, it's better to try to move yourself onto a position whereby in order to access those cloud resources, if you're trying to do that behind your own managed VPN, so that rather than saying, okay, well, I need to access this sort of um, this EC2 instance for whatever reason, 
Um, I'll just leave it open to the public internet because I don't know when where the developers are going to be. Maybe they'll be at home, maybe they won't, right? Maybe they'll be doing whatever in a coffee shop or something. We need to be able to handle that. Like, well, no, that's not the best way to go and do that. We better lock that down so that there's a, you know, something like a VPN in order to connect into those cloud providers as well, right? Not just in terms of VPN into your own particular um, site, right? If they're going to start connecting directly into the AWS regions, um, the AWS instances themselves, We'll consider whether or not you need to lock that access down to VPNs rather than that just being, you know, okay, well, we're never sure where somebody's going to go and be, so let's leave it open. You know, trying to lock that down is going to be important over 2021 as well. Awesome. Johnny, Ben, thank you guys. That was awesome. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't help but picture that famous cloud meme that floats around where the son asks his father, what's the cloud? And the dad just goes, it's a bunch of Linux servers, son. But yeah, um, if, if anyone in the audience is having trouble or looking to get more insights into their uh, cloud instances, we'd be happy to help. Uh, moving on here, I've heard you guys say this many a times, uh, good security is doing the fundamental well. You know, what can we do in 2021 just to get a better grasp of, of our programs? John, I think you're taking that one. Okay. So uh, in terms of getting back to basics, um, the this has always been true, right? So the world continues to change in ways that many of us haven't expected. Um, uh, but the fundamentals of what you need to go and do are always the same. So even if you are in a scenario we have moved into, to go back to the previous um, previous, uh, previous section in terms of cloud management, right? You, know, you still need to patch the things that are in there. You still need to have visibility. The number one enemy ultimately of sort of security monitoring, right? And being aware of your security is, well, visibility. If you don't have the logs, if you don't know what assets you have, if you don't understand those types of things, well, then it's very difficult to do any of the higher level things in front of that, uh, on top of that. You know, talk about security detection, you talk about threat hunting, you talk about all those other bits and pieces. Those are all built on top of some really strong fundamentals, like in terms of what are we monitoring, what are our assets. So, um, and it, it don't, even though we call it the basics, right, don't uh, underestimate how difficult it can be in order to do that well. One of the reasons why you still have, you know, reports in the, in the public domain in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, oh, uh, open S3 buckets being accessed, in terms of you know vulnerabilities from X years ago still being uh, exploited, or attackers at least still attempting those things. And the reason they attempt them is because they think they might be successful. You know, um, still trying to make sure that you do those basics well is really, really very important. Still a bit of a challenge and a, man a management challenge in terms of the scale as you start to open up and become a larger and larger organization, hopefully because you're becoming sort of more successful or perhaps because you have had to move a lot of your sort of back office things into you know, new systems. As it becomes larger and larger, keeping tabs on all of that can be a challenge. So um, there are lots of tools that exist out there in order to help that, there's lots of software. I mean, the security industry is, is uh, has a lot of different tools that you can choose from, let's put it that way. Um, if you wanted to go shopping, there is there is a very, very large Walmart out there that you can go into and then have a, an array and a spectrum of different things to pick from, right? Um, but being able to take those things in operation to use them and use them to actually drive the increase in the security in their business is still tough. That's a sort of inherent people problem, an inherent process problem, an inherent business problem, right? You say, well, I've got this tool. Will that tool solve the problem? I was like, well, you can use the tool to solve the problem, but you then also then have to have the tool and then also go and solve the problem. And that's still a thing that's the challenge. So um, if, if there is anyone who is struggling to get to some of those basics in terms of you know, visibility of your assets in terms of monitoring things and whatever else, I mean, I would always, my recommendation is always that rather than try to build the entire thing from scratch, you know, try to look to someone to partner with, at least in the short term, to try to get an idea in terms of if we did, if we were able to go and do those bits and pieces, like how would that change our business? Because uh, certainly from some of our customers, you know, one of the big things that I always try to um, uh, inf uh, reinforce to them is this idea that having us as a security partner should change your business for the better. We should be saying, well, you know, that thing you're doing is insecure. You, you might consider changing how you operate because we have identified something that is an insecure behavior. And if you can change that, then you'll become more secure in how you operate. Never mind the fact that you also have security monitoring, right, in order to watch things. But there are certain things you could be doing in order to operate more securely. So um, those kind of benefits that you can get certainly from a partner without having to say, okay, well, now I have to go build an entire sort of uh, an entire uh, 
system or team or department in order to address the tech's problems, right? Well, consider whether or not you can shortcut that if by sort of going with other people who can provide that to you. And then in the future, perhaps you can be in a scenario where we say, well, now that we've had that partnership and now we're sufficiently large, we're going to take on and internalize bits and pieces of that is a perfectly valid and in fact recommended way um, in order to build your security over time. Um, but certainly I've always, I've always, um, I've always had the perspective that partnering with someone to begin with on the start of your journey is a good way to make sure that you can get the best of both worlds. Ben, did you want to add anything to this? Or are you ready to, to move on to our favorite topic? Well, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and I'm aware that Joe, you like to crack the whip, but um, <laughs> it's not that I don't care, but yes, I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to add some things. Um, yeah, it, it, absolutely. Back to basics, uh, agree with everything there. Um, and from a business perspective or from an organizational perspective, something that really reassures me is the fact that whenever we're talking about doing the basics, the basics actually aren't that hard. And um, the basics are some of the easiest stuff to, to, to make a start on. And, and with security, I mean, we'll be talking about uh, the challenges in implementing a good security program in a, in a little bit, but with, with security, you just need to go and do, do something, do, do anything. Um, as long as it's one of those basics, well then you're doing the right thing by improving your security. Now, we, we look at from a sigilum perspective, we kind of look at security basics as being about five critical things, um, curiously aligned to the, the products and services we supply. But um, at, at core, you need to know what you've got in your environment. You need to look at what you're vulnerable to. You need to be able to patch it. You need to protect your endpoints against new threats. And then you need to monitor your whole environment. It's five things. And, and th those are, I mean, co at core, the basics, but they're different between different organizations. So you don't need to worry so much about modeling yourself exactly on what everyone else has got. You need to look at what's right for you. Um, and in your organization and your business and your verticals, it's important to try and identify um, either organizations, products, partners, services, wh whatever will help you in that area. So don't, don't worry that it doesn't look like everyone else's, just more make sure that it is for whatever you need fits those. A couple of other things that we've um, sort of over the years realized is, um, I've heard a lot of advice recently, particularly in, in COVID times, to avoid distractions. Um, and that's one that sort of triggered me a little bit a few weeks ago reading a blog post. And I don't really agree with that. I don't think it's a good strategy long term to avoid distractions. Distractions are distracting because they're usually important. And there's something that draws your attention. And it's important to consider that instead of avoiding them, just correctly engage with them. Um, and, and that means that it lets you focus on the basics, but do, don't, don't ignore the advanced stuff. Don't ignore the concerns of where you might be in a year. Just take a note of them. If you have a ticketing system, create a ticket, put it in the backlog, throw it out to 2022. Um, but do definitely uh, take stock of what you're doing in, in, in basic terms and those elements and think about where you want to go to as well. And it's always good within any core process for security to, to, to build in a, a pause and reflect moment and certain frameworks will have that inherently um, in terms of reviews and audits. Um, but it's good to, rather than consider an audit as an opportunity to panic and run around for three weeks, trying to find that, that, that one report that you couldn't locate three months ago, um, instead consider it as an opportunity to, to, hold, to hold back, to step, step the foot off the gas and think, right, okay, as well as what we need for compliance, what else can we think about in terms of next year? Where are we going to? Where's the strategy? Um, and building that into your core process is, is really, really helpful. So, and um, finally, I mean, I look at the basics as a foundation and uh, good luck if you try and build a house without a foundation. You need to start from a strong basics. Absolutely. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Johnny. All right, folks. So now we're going to move on to phishing. I'm sure everyone in attendance today has received an email, you know, disguised as a, an email that you should be getting. Um, you know, I personally have received a bunch from USPS over here in the States saying that I had a package delivered. No, I didn't have a package delivered. But luckily, you know, I was informed enough to act. So uh, Ben, you wanna start this one off? Yeah, I'll start off with an anecdote. Now I get fishing all the time. And um, in fact, I, where one of our, uh, <laughs> one, of, one of our analysts has actually written a book about the subject recently, but we, um, we're surprised every time we see a really good phishing attack. And I'm surprised not because the technology is particularly good. The technology doesn't really change. Um, but I'm surprised just at how ingenious people are. And so if we look at phishing, it, it, it's not new. Concept's not new. It's been around um, since classic corn artistry. That's really what it is. It's just corn artistry plus the latest technology. Um, 
and it will be around for as long as it works. And that's the reality, it still works. And it changes whenever we try and do something about it. This is the nature of security and defense. So uh, this, uh, the, the report from Verizon Business, uh, yeah, doesn't surprise me in the slightest, but it's not because phishing is becoming intricately more technically complex. It's, it's not really, we haven't seen evidence of that. What we have seen is uh, maybe a change to what we're looking at. I think, Johnny, you mentioned earlier that uh, there is a couple of key things. I mean, the government right now, well, the foreseeable past and future, is giving out free money uh, to a lot of organizations. So it's not just a, hey, look, there might be free money. I mean, people know what's happening. And that's certainly provided a lot of that drive, those sorts of concepts and, and the new normal. Um, but I mean, if we look at it as a leap in logic, I mean, I don't think we can definitively say the increase in success of fishing is because of COVID. Um, but I mean, it's not a, it's not too much of a leap in logic to, to look at that as being the major differentiator. But as well as the subject matter, I mean, the subject matter of fishing always updates itself to whatever the latest thing is. So in the years before that, um, there was certainly, I mean, I know uh, US government policy, there was a couple of items over the past, uh, the previous four years term, where those were pulled out and used as ammunition for phishing attacks, and they worked. And even into the social manipulation, if you look at uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, accusations, and I'm going to stop there before I say something legally actionable, but accusations and the impact of those, uh, really those are just exploiting people, really exploiting people rather than so much exploiting the technology. And uh, some key things that I haven't seen called out often um, with the uh, effectiveness of fish enemy, things to consider. Uh, IT and security teams are some of the hardest hit, absolutely hardest hit during the major transition phase. And yeah, I accept that everybody has been uprooted from their, their workplace and everything they know and moved to the home. Uh, but on top of that, the people engineering and helping that move, logistics, administration, IT, security, th those folks are under a tremendous amount of stress. And when those teams become stressed and pressured, the amount of time they have to do other things disappears. Um, and that means the amount of time they have to go and uh, update phishing filters and the amount of time they have to go and uh, conduct uh, simulations, etc. on that. And the amount of time they have to go and deep dive in their own logs that all goes down because of this mass move to remote, uh, mass mass remote IT support. So that's certainly, I think, been a factor. Um, other things, if you look at the individuals, um, as we are now all working from our new normal um, at home, uh, there's a huge number of distractions. And what I've noticed, and this is an observational point, I've noticed that a lot of uh, colleagues, they deal with their email backlog um, while they're doing other household tasks. So they're particularly at the minute homeschooling the kids or being on the phone or something like that. And that, that's a much more distracting environment. And so it means it's more likely for people maybe not to be thinking about what they're doing as much, just clicking through the emails going, oh, that's, that's John, John sent me that thing, click, boom, next, and so on and so forth. So when that happens, people aren't as focused and it opens that, that social engineering element. Um, other things to consider, a lot of organizations weren't ready for a move to remote working. So they very rapidly issued new hardware, new software and new measures, and they threw them out into the, into the ocean and they just hoped they would float. Um, I'm aware uh, if you look at secondhand hardware trends, the entire secondhand hardware market's been devastated for laptops, There's just nothing left. Um, it's all been bought and all been commissioned and all been shipped super, super rapidly. And that's everything from office workers who've moved or kids who are now trying to study from just so, so much. So that all of the new hardware, software tools. Um, and then I think something that helps as well is that we talked about focus and distraction, but uh, when people are sitting in the comfort of their, own, of their own home, maybe they don't feel that pair of eyes on them uh, from the corner of the room where corpse sex sits. So maybe there's not that thought that people, some, someone's watching all the time or there's maybe not that formality about it. So if we come to what we actually do about that, the, the critical thing with fishing is, is, is defense in depth. You can talk about the security on units, layers. You, you do lots of things. And that starts with training. Starts with training your people, uh, frequently training them. And particularly now, um, we've been through a few iterations of our fishing training, as, as you know, Joe. And something that I can, I can compliment some of the training programs on is that they've evolved. I've seen others in organizations where they haven't really changed their fishing training since 2014. The problem with that is that fishing has changed a lot since 2014, so it doesn't look like that anymore. And the average user needs to see something that's pretty representative. So it's important to train your staff, but also to keep your training materials up to date on that. Um, and a second part then on the people aspect or on the preventative measure is simulated exercises. 
absolutely uh, there are tools out there for your IT department to be sending phishing emails internally and they can get super crafty with them uh, to the point where uh, sometimes uh, some of our internal messaging has actually been mistakenly uh, marked as phishing because it looks so close to a phishing attack um, but it's, it's critical you simulate otherwise you don't know how effective your training is um, but then moving on in terms of defense I say this is a layered approach so prevention is great but eventually someone's going to click something they shouldn't have absent mindedly or, or ignorantly or, or whatever um, and at that point really what you're looking for are the other defenses so obviously blockers which will block a percentage of phishing is great but when some gets through at that point you're looking for your endpoint protection and then you're looking for lateral movement and that comes to defense in depth where you've got endpoint protection in place which will catch despite the injection will catch say snippets of code or remote code execution or going to websites or going places you shouldn't uh, combined with security monitoring so if somebody does breach you you've got someone looking for any other indicators of compromise the sorts of things which will give away an attacker who's, who's, who's gained access to your network or access to your systems. Um, so that lateral movement is, is the next stage. And that can be picked up over a period of days, weeks, months afterwards. Um, and it's absolutely critical. Uh, so really from a phishing perspective, it hasn't gone away and it's not going to, till it stops working. And that's, uh, it's been working for about 5,000 years uh, in terms of con artistry. So it's not gonna change. Um, in terms of reasons, yeah, it's pretty pretty clear. It's majority because of COVID, um, and the best defense is a defense in depth with multiple layers. John, have you anything anything to add? I'm sure you do. Uh, yeah, when when do I ever not? So um, the thing I would probably try to the thing I would probably try to uh, impringe on people's minds is to widen their scope in terms of what they consider phishing to be. So uh, or the threat that phishing represents. So. Um, uh, most people from which you're talking about uh, phishing, right, they imagine the email that comes in and then they, they go and click it and they go, I know how to solve that. The thing I'll solve that is I'm going to get this system that sits in front of my Office 365 or other email inbox and that will stop the email get, getting in and then problem solved. And like, well, yes, up to a point, right? That is only one aspect of it. Really rather, consider phishing rather than thinking we need to protect ourselves against phishing. It's more trying to identify, well, how do I, pro how do I protect the credentials of my staff and the reason you're protecting the credentials of your staff is because you don't want somebody else to get them and then be able to log in. But consider it this way, right? And as there are more and more breaches that are going on all around the world, like not necessarily you, you might be sitting there and, and saying, okay, well, there's uh, all these breaches are going on for all these companies out there. That's terrible, right? LinkedIn got breached. All these breaches got breached. That's, that, that, that's awful, but it's not a threat to me. It's like, well, actually, whenever you consider that in terms of, rather than thinking about phishing specifically, if I don't care, well, I haven't got any emails, that's fine. It's a bit, well, hang on a minute. In terms of the, all the people that work in my organization, did any of them use those types of systems? And if they did use any of those types of systems, what were the chances that the same username and same password might have been used in there? And like the reason I use LinkedIn, the actual LinkedIn bridge is a good while ago, but I mean, it's, it's a good example because how many people might have used their corporate email in order to sign up for and get into LinkedIn? An untrivial number of people. How many people would also have used the same password in order to get onto their system as they would have done on LinkedIn, again, maybe an, an untrivial number of people. So from that perspective, that breach out there might then represent a risk towards you, not because of anything that's happened, right? But because the credentials that would have been fished don't need to be fished anymore because they're sitting out there in the public domain. And if an attacker gets that, well, they can get in just the same. So in terms of your uh, ability to combat phishing, you're not really combating phishing, you're combating the loss of your user's credentials. And then, you cannot know necessarily, okay, well, all that stuff was in the LinkedIn breach, right? All that stuff was stolen from those systems. So how can you actually protect against those types of things? And that's why I think over the last couple of years, and I think we'll become more and more of a thing over 2021 and further on is in terms of that user behavioral analysis, right? Because you might not know that there was a breach that happened over there when somebody inside your organization had used the same credentials over there. And now that's a risk to you. But what you can know is, well, hang on a minute, that guy doesn't tend to, log in at you know six o'clock that's a bit strange maybe somebody should have a look at that oh that's not his usual ip either it's in the us and he is in the us but it's a bit weird that's that's not from the same state okay well maybe we should have a look at that and go well, actually hang on a minute he didn't log in at all well now we've got a problem right but rather than having to look through 100 percent of everybody's lo uh, sort of logins right well then that's an enormous piece of effort which isn't necessarily the best way to go to approach that. Whereas something that is more to do with trying to classify what is normal for a user and anything outside of that has the capacity to say, well, hang on a minute, you know, how did that person get in? 
And in the end, the, the way that that external person may have got in might be because of those credentials all the way over there. You might never find that, but you still have to go and try and identify that that's happened as a threat to your business. So um, that's the thing I would uh, in principle on people is to try to identify, is try to widen their scope in terms of, well, I need to protect my user's credentials, therefore phishing. Well, not necessarily. How do you widen out that scope of what the threat actually looks like and try to put in place different protections in order to try to uh, identify what you know may be happening, but you need to be able to detect it on your end whenever it actually sort of impacts you um, in the end. Excellent, thanks, Johnny. Ben, um, did you want to add? Yeah, sorry, I just this one, this one, it just only came to me because of a recent conversation in a family group about credentials and um, how I'm trying to protect. <laughs> I hope they're not watching. Protect some of my. Uh, less security savvy relatives. Um, so a couple of things are really coming to the forefront. Data analytics with regards to individuals are becoming super advanced. And if you saw recently, very topical, you'll have realized that WhatsApp and Facebook have made some changes to their policies, specifically on correlation of users across multiple platforms. And if you look at it, there's a couple of um, infographs on the data different systems use, but it is scarily, scarily good how they can link you between different organizations, between different parts of your life and put a bundle together of you as a person. And if Facebook are doing it, I guarantee um, other groups are doing it too. Less, well, <laughs> again, I'm not gonna say anything actionable. Uh, other non-reputable groups or non-reputable groups are doing it. So something to consider is just how easy it is to put together personal profile information against a workplace information, particularly with tools like LinkedIn. There was one and, and a second sort of anecdote that came to me in regards to reuse of passwords uh, back in the late 90s at the, the dawn of so the World Wide Web. Um, there was one of the most popular at the time sort of gray hat, virgin on black hat websites. Uh, we was using something called PHP BB, which is old style bulletin board, um, but they'd written a mod or they'd modified the code for the password uh, entry system so that if you entered an incorrect password, or any password, it didn't salt it, it didn't actually protect it, but it would then automatically go off and try that password with your username in lots and lots of other websites. And the number of compromises which were found, this is from a, a an organization or a group of people who are professing to be experts in security, whether white hat or black hat, um, and they were reusing passwords endlessly. And it's not as if that's been a, that's a recent thing, it's never been a, a good idea to reuse passwords. So it's absolutely critical that you look at those links between systems and yeah, absolutely agree on what you said, Johnny, and the fact that, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a very ingenious way to be able to link those and, and it, it is happening. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> I've got one thing to add to this too. I just saw it yesterday on Facebook. Uh, people are doing these contests where they'll be like, drop your birth date in the comments below for a chance to win. It's just like, Please don't do that, you guys. Um, so yeah, just a little tidbit thought I'd share. Um, moving on here, Johnny, let's talk a little bit about what folks can do. You know, lack of resources is a struggle for a lot of people out there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, again, we keep coming back to COVID in the current world, right? Lots of things are being squeezed, right? And we're all trying to do a little bit more with, with a little bit less in some instances, right? Um, so uh, and the cybersecurity industry really, you know, is no different from that sort of paradigm, right? We're, we're there in order to try to reduce the overall amount of uh, cost in terms of resources or money that people are spending on cybersecurity, right? Um, so the thing that I would just say to people in terms of, in terms of that, right, is um, cybersecurity ultimately is always about risk. It's about trying to address a particular risk. So if I was to try to draw an analogy towards say, if you owned a factory, right? And you'd say, okay, well, we need to protect our factory. We need to make sure people can't break into our factory. It's like, we only have a certain amount of money, right? It's like, okay, well, I mean, in order to make it super duper secure, what we could do is we could break up all the windows and we could bury it underground. But that'd be really expensive and it'd also be really disruptive to actually the factory how it's meant to work, right? But I mean, if it was really, really important, like if it was building, I don't know, nuclear components, you go, mm, maybe we are gonna go and do that. But for most other people, you're not gonna go and do that, right? Now, you still have to do the best that you can with the resources at your disposal, right? So if you're in the factory and you don't lock your doors, locking your doors is a kind of nearly free, kind of very recommended thing. So that's the kind of thing you should go and do, right? But, you know, in the end, if you've locked all your doors and you've done all the things that you can with the budget and resources at your disposal, and then, you know, an elite group of uh, sort of uh, Catwoman and Batman style skilled, you know, superheroes manage to find their way into your factory, you go, well, I mean, 
I did compensate for all these different types of risks. That's not really a risk that I really anticipated, right? And the great, uh, the great representation of this is the, the recent solar winds, um, sort of activity that went on um, where uh, attackers were able to gain access into, you know, into the US government departments, governments all around the world, <clears throat> excuse me, um, because of this sort of way of um, compromising a third party and then being able to smuggle uh, uh, malicious code into those instances because of that. Now, beforehand, they, they hadn't conceived of that as necessarily being a particular threat that they had seen, and then that threat appeared out of nowhere, right? But the fact that that's difficult for them to go and do doesn't mean that we can still do the best that we can and we can optimize for the resources at our disposal. We are all doing the best that we can with the things in our disposal. We just have to try to perhaps find different ways that are more effective or more efficient, or in some instances, that if, if you can't have the, 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 um, you know, the paid tool or things like that, right? Then, well, you know, if you can't have that, and that's just the way that it's gonna be. It, are there open source alternatives that you can use? Are there different ways that you can use things that are in the public domain that InfoSec professionals, InfoSec, one of the reasons I love InfoSec um, as a profession is how giving they are and how much they take something that they've created and then say, well, this will be very good for all people rather than me necessarily hoarding this or whatever else. So instead, I'll just give this to the community. There's lots of good resources. There's lots of good tools and things that are out there. They can help you secure yourself you know, from a from a low cost perspective, you're still going to have to pay for it in terms of some resources and time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, in, in that crunch, just consider is there a more effective way to use your uh, to use your budget and use those systems? Um, and maybe there are other things you hadn't previously considered. You know, any any challenge is also an opportunity for innovation, right? So you know, it might not necessarily seem seem like that in terms of resources and um, budgetary perspective, but you know, maybe you can find a different way to go and do things and actually come out of that better in the end, right? And you know, I think in the, in the end, that's all we can really hope for out of the likes of all of the um, all the disruption we've we've had. We talked way at the start about the fact of um, you know COVID um, being very very disruptive. Maybe one of the you know uh, one of the positive things you can take out of that is a different way in terms of our work life balances and you know people working from home in a way that is more conductive to their way of existing. Right, that can be a positive that can be taken out of that. You know, and hopefully in terms of reevaluating, you know, what are you going to do about your security? Right. Well, maybe that can be a positive outcome that comes out of it as well. So though, though these impacts need not necessarily, you know, uh, cause your security to suffer, can, can, can cause you to rethink about the problem, reprioritize, maybe you're better off in the end. So um, I try to look at it from that perspective. Great way to look at it, John. Uh, ben, what do you got for us? Well, what I had, and I've actually thought of three or four more things, but again, Joe, I'm very aware you're looking at the clock and pushing that kick under the table button. Um, so one of the key things when it comes to a resource constrained environment, one of the most important things to do is plan. Um, it's to work out exactly in advance what you think you're going to need rather than just going by the, well, we'll ask for budget when we think we need it. Um, that's a terrible idea. So advanced planning really lets you make the, the best use of your resources. And that comes down to being able to look holistically over the course of your next one year, two year, three years, whatever, and say, okay, we know we're constrained, but do we buy the door locks or do we try and save up to brick all the windows up? I mean, that's that comes down to knowing what you think is going to happen in two or three months time and knowing what your, your strategy is. So just having a reactive strategy is a terrible idea for, for resource uh, constrained situations. Um, another thing that really jumps to mind is that whenever you're resource constrained, one of the most important things you can do is make the best use of what you have. And that's something which speaks to even the core of, of us and um, some of the best engagements and, and most uh, most rewarding engagements we have with customers are where we have an engagement about how they can better utilize our services, how they can um, without a huge increase in cost, how they can expand what it is we're doing for them, uh, how they can engage with us more easily or more efficiently. And that's a, that's a conversation we welcome and it's conversations, part of the reason we have a CSA team, they kick those conversations off every every month with a customer. I mean, it's always anyways, okay, so what's next? What are you doing next? How can we help you next? What's the next thing? And so, yeah, really digging in deep and making sure that, well, if you do have a patch management solution, are you using it? You know, are, are you actually using it effectively? Is it, is it making sure that it has all of your your systems patched? Um, if you've got uh, something like Sentinel-1, the endpoint protection, um, are you using it to its fullest? Are you protecting all of your devices? Are you using all of the licenses for it that you have? I mean, there's not a pile of production machines sitting in a warehouse somewhere that just aren't protected. 
um, if you've got those if you've got those services, use it. And likewise with security monitoring, uh, making sure that you are sending us the logs which are important and that are relevant. Um, making sure that uh, if there's new parts to your environment that you're making best use of the monitoring you have to also expand and cover onto those, uh, keeping up to date from those fronts. So yeah, when we're resource constrained, you have to make a lot less, go a lot further, and um, definitely helps whenever what you what you have is working to, to its optimum optimum degree. Even down to scene management, um, looking to see, I know from a content perspective, um, us and our partners, we, we're constantly looking at what new content we can ship there. And that's that's extra value that is almost at zero cost. So making sure that you're getting up to the date security content packs, making sure you're on the latest and greatest. Um, all, all of this helps. And as Johnny mentioned already, the security industry is almost unique to my knowledge in the fact that it will share knowledge and it will share expertise and it will share an awful lot um, without a huge amount of cost. Um, there's a lot of value adds. There's a lot more demonstration value that's in there. So it's really, really good to be part of that industry. It certainly gives me a warm feeling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnny. It does feel good to help people. And <clears throat> this is a perfect segue, guys. Um, thank you all for attending. For those of you that don't know, uh, Sigilant started in 2001 as a SIM vendor to the federal government in Fortune 500. Um, you know, we pivoted and formed the service because uh, of the belief that if technology alone could solve the problem, it already would have. Uh, you know, there will always be a need for the human element, the likes of Johnny, the likes of Ben. And, you know, that said, we do still need technology. And when it comes to technology and it comes to people at Sigilent, we choose the best. And we pride ourselves on working alongside you um, along your cybersecurity journey. And we know that each organization's network is unique. It's completely different. And, you know, we treat everyone as... Uh, intimately as we can to best understand your network and provide the solutions that are right for you. Um, the perfect combination of people, process, and technology is what we aim to deliver. And we like to do that, you know, without breaking the bank. And um, with that said, folks, I would like to uh, give you guys a couple of things to take away from today's session. Everyone in attendance will be receiving uh, a blog that Johnny wrote not too long ago about the, the threats in 2021. You can arm yourselves with that, as well as a technical brief that will give you some more insight into Sigilent and what we're about. So with that, I'll let everyone get back to their day and uh, Sigilent is out. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.